All right, so this is Physics 1C for June 2nd. Today we're talking about electromagnetic waves, or EM waves. Um, we had said before, last lecture, that what we left off with was a discussion of like what an electromagnetic wave is, what light is. And we said that anytime you have a charged particle, right? So if you have uh, a charged particle, let's say a positively charged particle, if this particle is to oscillate up and down, we showed that you can basically think of um, waves of the electric field is emanating out from this, like this. Those waves are effectively waves of the electric field itself. And uh, the wave itself is what was going to become what we call light. Um, now, to understand uh, something about, um, let me make sure that I can see questions you guys asking. Right. Uh, to, to understand something about what's happening here, um, and how something like this would look, um, I want you guys to think about a star. So say you have a star, and let's say you're viewing it from some planet over here. Okay. Let's say that this is Earth, and you're viewing the star. The star is uh, made of plasma. Plasma is hot ionized gas, which basically means it's a gas of like charged particles. That's the thing that makes it different from a normal gas. Uh, a gas like the air in your room right here is composed of neutral particles, like an oxygen molecule is neutral, a nitrogen molecule would be neutral. Um, but once you heat up uh, any kind of a gas hot enough, then you ionize the material, you rip away the electrons from the nuclei, and then you have this hot, dense, charged gas full of particles that are zipping all over the place all the time, and that wiggling basically turns into this right here. So we say that this kind of a star is gonna send out waves, okay? And the kind of waves it's gonna send out are gonna be kind of similar to the waves of a ripple in a pond. So there's gonna be uh, a wave that kind of goes out like this away from the star. Uh, you might call it like a, whoops. You might say that the, the wave fronts will be spherical, okay? Each of these representing like a, a crest of a wave. So the wave is kind of going up, down like this. Right? And it's going forward, you know, just like what I'm describing up here, but kind of coming out of the star, right? And as you get farther and farther away from these, the wave fronts start to get bigger and bigger, right? And the curvature of those waves starts to flatten out a little bit, right? And this is just like ripples in a pond. The star is just making ripples in the electric field, right? Um, and so eventually, once we get all the way over here to our vantage point, those waves might actually be um, roughly like a line, right? Uh, the closer you are to the star, the waves are going to be really curvy, but the curvature is going to decrease as you go over here until uh, the wave that's coming at you might look just like a straight line. Okay, and let's move the pointer over a little bit here. So effectively what ends up happening now, uh, let's use lines to represent this, is that your wave fronts, okay, start to literally become straight lines like this. Oh no, it takes it below, that's annoying your wave fronts literally become straight lines just like this. And let's see if we can copy paste it right here. Yeah. So those are your wave fronts now. So each of these represents what we call a wave front. You can imagine sitting on the shore and seeing um, water waves coming and hitting the shore, right? It's the same idea. The water waves come, when you're close to the shore, they might look like straight lines coming in, right? And then they crash on the shore. Um, we call these um, wave fronts. And the fact that the wave is parallel like this, when the wave fronts are parallel, we call this a, um, a plane wave. So this is called a plane wave at this point. <clears throat> and I hope that makes some kind of sense. Stars are incredibly far away from us, right? Other than the sun. I think the nearest star is something like uh, three light years away at its closest distance, maybe four, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. It's called Alpha or Proxima Centauri. Um, they're very, very far away, right? So you can imagine that the light that is emitted by the star is emitted over the surface of a sphere, and that sphere grows in size and grows in size and grows in size to the point where once it gets to Earth, it's basically just like a flat sheet that you're looking at, right? Over here, you'd be looking at a sphere that, of which we're looking at just one cross-section of it, but then when you get closer to the planet, you're looking at plane waves that are kind of coming in like this. And that's what we call a plane wave, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Um, do you guys have any questions? Can you picture this in your mind? All right. 
so plane wave. Now, this plane wave, okay, uh, is composed of electric and magnetic fields. Electric and magnetic fields. That's what the wave is. It's a wave of the field, right? Like this is the electric field up here, and the oscillations in the electric field give you uh, what's going on with uh, this charged particle here and the light that's emitted by it. So the plane wave is composed of electric and magnetic fields. And that the way that those fields are oriented is such that the electric field might be in this plane right here. This might be like your electric field. But then at right angles to that, um, you have your magnetic field, okay? The magnetic field is, is kind of pointing like this. And these two are at right angles to each other. And the direction that the wave propagates them, the light from the wave, so to speak, propagates this way. This is the, the velocity of the wave at any point in time. And that velocity, V, is equal to the speed of light, Vc. Speed of light is the speed of light is equal to, it was measured before we knew that it was an electromagnetic wave by using starlight and other methods, uh, such as little wheels that turn. Um, we've discovered that this is basically what the speed of light is, and it is effectively a constant, it's a universal constant. They didn't know that at that time, but uh, at least now it is. We, we believe that the speed of light is a universal constant thanks to Einstein. So these three things are at right angles to each other, right? The electric and magnetic fields are at right angles to each other, and they're both uh, at right angles to the velocity. And we can say some things about what's going on here. First of all, we can say that the direction of propagation of the wave, okay, is given by this vector. If you take E cross V, this is gonna give us a quantity that we're later gonna call the pointing vector. It's related to power. But for now, the direction of prop propagation is given by E cross V, right? So if you remember your right-hand rule and you look at the wave, the electric field if it points up and if the magnetic field kind of comes out of the page, if you do E cross V with your hands, right? You rotate from here to here with your, your right hand, then you're gonna get um, the direction of the wave, which is this way. If the magnetic field was pointing into the page, then the direction of the wave would be what? back the other direction, right? So that's one of the things we know about. The direction of the propagation of the wave is going to be given by uh, E cross B. We also know, another thing uh, that we know about this type of a wave is uh, that it has a fixed ratio. Of, what is it? I think E over B. Yeah. The electric field magnitude divided by the magnetic field magnitude happens to be exactly equal to the speed of light. That's something that we're going to use. And what else is there? Um, yep, the wave travels in vacuum with an unchanging speed c. Uh, and unlike mechanical waves, there's no medium needed for this, right? Mechanical waves, waves need a medium. Like if you want to have a water wave, you need water. If you want to have a sound wave, you need air. You can't have a sound wave in space where there is no medium. But for whatever reason, light can propagate through space because it doesn't need a medium because it's quite literally an oscillation of electric fields. It doesn't need a medium because the fields themselves are what it oscillates through. Okay. Um, so let's take this picture okay, of these, these plain, plain wave fronts. I want, I want you to understand about this, that these wave fronts basically, they're like planes. They have three dimensions, right? Uh, I don't know how much I want to draw this for. I add another line over here. The idea is that this this is a planar it's a plane wave. It's a plane coming at the the earth, right? Like a sheet. It's like a sheet coming at the earth. And each piece of the sheet is composed of these fields right here, which is what I'm going to show you next. Okay. So let's take um, I think we need a three dimensional coordinate system. Uh, I'll draw a column with that, I guess. So. Let's say we have a coordinate system that looks something like this. And within this coordinate system, I want to put a square. Can I draw a square? No, I can't. Let's see, how can I draw a square that'll be? Will this work? I want to make it parallel. One of these sides parallel to, OK, I can do that. Do I need to do something like? I want the lowest side to be parallel to the z-axis. I don't know if I can do that or not. 
the way this is working. I think I'm crazy. How do I make the top or bottom parallel to the Z axis? Hmm. Not sure. Okay, in that case, what we'll do is uh, we're just going to draw some cheats here. So we'll take lines and we'll just make like that. figure out we can do another line from here to there but it needs to be parallel to the z-axis I think that looks good and we'll take this one and attach it to it and then we'll copy this one and attach to those okay so this is going to be uh, one sheet of our wave so this is our, we'll call it a, a plane wave front, okay? And in my system here, these are normal axes, as you might expect, I guess, that this is going to be x, this is going to be the y-axis, and this will be the positive z-axis, and that will be the negative z-axis on the plane. Okay. Now, within my, uh, within my system, I'm going to have multiple versions of these. So I'll just say, like, this plane wave, right, there's going to be copies of it. So I'll... I'll move here. Let me see if I can. Let's see. Control. Can I control click these? No, I can't. Okay. We'll just go like copy paste, and we'll just put it a little farther forward, just to indicate that there are going to be. Um, it's going to kind of cut across the over. That's probably fine. Take this one. So these are your plane wave fronts, okay? And uh, on these waves, um, we can kind of indicate what they're, what they're composed of, all right? Each one of these waves is going to have an electric field and a magnetic field. So inside of this, I'll draw. Now I want arrows, I guess, so I'm continuing to use these shapes. So each one of these waves is going to have something like, ooh, wait, is there like a, this is what I want, actually, kind of. Oops, that. Oh, but I won't be able to draw like I want to. Now we can't do that. We'll go this arrow. So each one of these waves is going to have something like this. There's going to be an electric field that's going to be pointing in the z direction, like this. Oh, the tilt is a little bit for some reason. There's going to be an electric field component pointing in the z direction here. So we'll say that's the electric field. And then there's going to be a magnetic field component that's going to be pointing at right angles to that. So we can also draw in here a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is going to kind of point this way. So the magnetic field uh, at a moment in time is going to have a component that points along the positive z-axis, and the electric field is going to have a component that points along the positive y-axis. Um, this one, I want to be parallel to y, right? So that's the electric field, and then down here, no, I want to click that, this is the magnetic field. I'll just move that little guy a little bit here. There we go. So you've got the electric field vector pointing up, and you've got the magnetic field vector pointing this way, and they are vectors, so I should at least put some arrows on them to represent them. This is like a piece of your wave. Okay. This is like the electric field component, this is the magnetic field component. And that ex same exact thing is going to exist um, in, the, in the next kind of portion of this here. So if we copy this, oops. Um, I don't know if I'd be able to just copy that. It's kind of hard. So we'll just copy this. Um, maybe? Oh, i got to move this thing. Um, okay. Maybe I could just have you guys imagine, because it's messing things up now. That in the next plane plane wave front, you're also going to have something like this as well, and maybe something I can pull on to remind you guys of like what this looks like is I think I used in last week's lecture. Here it is, this thing. Oh yeah, so let me go to here. I'm just going to put this right here so you can get a picture of like what I'm kind of thinking of here. Uh, let's make it a little smaller. Put it up here in the corner. So this is the idea of like what our what our wave looks like, but we're just kind of cutting it out, you know, basically like this little region right here. We're looking at just that point, and as we go from wavefront to wavefront, um, the values of these fields are going to change. So like when we go to the next wavefront right here, and we look at our electric field, um, you know, our electric field vector now may be a little bit different. Maybe it's got a little bit smaller. So now that's our new electric field, and maybe we call that. God, it won't let me type where I want to type. Type right here. Nope. 
maybe we call this electric field value E prime or something like that. And you're gonna have a magnetic field at this location, but they have a fixed ratio. So if the electric field gets smaller, the magnetic field has to get smaller too. And so maybe your magnetic field vector now is pointing kind of like this, but it's gotten a little bit smaller. Okay, and maybe we call that one D prime. Does that make sense? Coming from this picture here to this picture here, the, the wave is moving with a velocity C to the right. So we could also add a vector on here to represent the speed of the wave. The speed of the wave is you know pointing along the right direction. And uh, we can put a of that too. So this is the direction of the velocity of our wave. It goes this way. And maybe that's actually better to put at the front of it. The wave is basically moving off in this direction. Okay, That's the, the velocity of the wave front. That's your, right here is your velocity C, whatever. Mm, yeah. So the wave is moving to the right with some velocity. It has these components. It's got an electric field value here, a different electric field value on this, on this face, some magnetic field value here, and a different magnetic field value here. And all throughout the plane, which extends infinitely, right? You've got different values of the electric field. So there's also going to be like plane waves over here, plane waves over here. And individually within this wave, you're going to have different values of the electric field, like over here, over here. At each point in space, right, you're going to have a value for these things because it's a it's a vector field, right? Every point in space, you're going to have a, an arrow. And yeah, this is the kind we're looking at. Now, this is a very special type of a wave. We call this linearly polarized light. Uh, it's something you'll learn about if you take a physics 1D. But it has to do with the fact that these, these electric fields are only oscillating one dimension and the magnetic fields are only oscillating one dimension, okay? So that's our wavefront. It's composed of electric and magnetic fields. And the next thing we wanna do now is we wanna draw kind of a side version of what we're seeing here, something just the, a cut of just the XY plane itself, okay? So if we look at a cut of just the XY plane right here, oops, it's just the same colors. So here's, oops, shape. So here's my XY plane. And I'm gonna make it a little bigger. We're gonna cut off. And yeah, that's fine. Oh, you don't need to use that, do you? Okay. I'll just like do like that. I just wanna look at the x, y axis. Uh, the first quadrant, I should say. So there's my axes that I want. And I'll even make these a little bigger, probably, so we can draw what we need to draw. So suppose that we do the following. Suppose that we look at these two wave runs right here and we draw a two-dimensional version of what we're seeing. And to be really clear right here, this is gonna be uh, X and this is gonna be Y. And what we're gonna do, let's see, I can do this way. Um, we're gonna look at something like this. That's gonna be a path in space that we're gonna traverse. And that path is gonna be shown up like that. Uh, there's a box again. That path is gonna kind of show up like this on our space. And we're just gonna kind of blow it up. And we're gonna basically say that um, the one side of this is gonna have length A. The other side's gonna have a length that we're gonna call delta X. And you know what I realized? I've got my X and Y mixed up here. That would be your Y axis. That would be your X axis. Almost did it again, y and x. So this is gonna be delta x, this is gonna be a of this path that we're creating here, okay? And on the left side of the path, we're gonna say, well, there's an electric field component uh, along this side that we're gonna call it ey, okay? So we're gonna use our little arrows again and say we've got an electric field component here. Um, it's just so much easier to do this with a mouse, all these kind of things. Um, we've got an electric field component over here. I'll put it at the very bottom. And that one we'll call E. And then we're gonna have another vector on the right-hand side over here. Um, shape, nope, not that shape, this shape, Y. Arrow. Okay, in my picture I'm making it smaller here, right? So it's like on the left-hand side, this is going to be, um, we're gonna call this the a y component uh, of our electric field pointing up like this. And then over here, we're gonna call this one um, EY prime. Okay. And in addition, we also have this magnetic field vector that's sticking out, okay? But what we're gonna do is say that, suppose that our box is really small, okay? Like that this 
path that we're, that we're drawing here is very small. So small that we're going to make the assumption that the magnetic field over this region is going to be um, constant. So we're going to say that our magnetic field in this region is going to be pointing, well, it points over here. You can see it points out towards us, right? So on this picture right here, I'm going to say that there's kind of an average magnetic field within this region. And since it points along the z direction, we're going to call that uh, just bz. And that's going to be kind of the average value over this entire region. Assuming that this is small, uh, we're going to assume that the magnetic field is roughly constant. And what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, Faraday's law um, to analyze what's going on in the system. Okay. Now, we drew it here, but I'm going to probably move it down a little bit so we can do some mathematics with it. Hopefully you guys can see how the picture on the left can turn into the picture on the right when we zoom in on just that path that we did right there. So let's come down here. Let's put this in here. And in fact, let's maybe make it a little smaller. It doesn't need to be this big. Does that still look okay? The A got kind of small, but that, that's just that distance. A, delta X. Okay. So here's what we're going to do now. Um, now we're going to say that uh, um, Faraday's law states that if I take the path integral of e dot ds, that I get um, negative d dt of flux, where flux is basically equal to, you know, this, the surface integral of d dot da. If I take the path integral, okay, what's a path integral? Just to remind you, the path in this case is going to be pointing like this. I think we're going this way, right? I think so. Yeah, we want it to go that way. This is going to be what ds represents. We're going to evaluate e dot ds, the electric field dot product with ds, all along my path right here. Okay, we've done this before. Now we're just doing it with a wave. It's the only difference. The way that I'm traveling is basically the same direction as the magnetic field. Um, yeah. So let's work out both sides of this equation. So for the left-hand side, we evaluate e dot ds, okay? And we imagine within this regime that the electric field is only pointing along the y direction, right? And that means that when I evaluate e dot ds on the lower side here, I get 0. When I evaluate e dot ds on the right side here, I'm going to get ey prime times ds. Um, and in fact, if the electric field is constant over that region, I'm just going to get ey prime times the length of this distance right here, which means I'm going to get ey prime times a. So that's the first contribution I'm going to get over here. Is oh, I'll, I'll use black for this part. So I would say ey prime multiplied by the distance a, that's what I get over here. When I go across the top, the electric field is effectively pointing at every point here at a right angle. This would be like the direction of the electric field would be pointing like this, but it's at a right angle to ds. So when you do e dot ds, you don't get anything. And then on this side over here, because ds is down, but ey is up, you're going to get a minus ey multiplied by a. That's what the left-hand side of this equation is going to give you. Does that make sense to you guys? Does anyone have any questions? Just doing this line integral where we assume ey prime is the value of the electric field over here. So you take that times the distance, you get zero here, and you get negative here. Because when you do a dot product and the vectors are opposite directions, you get a negative sign. Does this make sense? Does anyone have any questions? Nothing. This is nothing we haven't done before. It's just applied to a wave, an electromagnetic wave, as opposed to, um, yeah. All right. So this is the part where I almost want to finish the left-hand side first and then come back to the right-hand side. I kind of want to do that. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a statement about what EY prime is in relation to EY. I wonder if we've done this actually a couple times now. 
I wonder if you guys can tell me what this is. This is like the third class in a row where we've had to make this replacement that I'm about to re replace right here. How do you guys think that EY prime uh, is related to the electric field over here? If you were to write in chat what you think it's going to be, it's going to be the value of EY plus something. You guys remember what it was? What what comes next here? How is EY prime, the electric field over here, related to the electric field over here? And it really it's related by a derivative, basically. Well, or there's two different ways you can do it. And I left something out of this. Um, the electric field, in this case, EY, is a function of X and T. It's a function of X and T. So actually, we're going to go through this a little bit different way than we did before. I'll do this, the way, method I was about to use would work too. We're going to say that um, the value of EY prime is going to be equal to the... Um, we're going to write it like this. The other way I feel like it's so much simpler, but I'm looking at my notes. I don't want to be consistent with your guys' textbooks. You can go back and look at their derivation and understand it. Um, what I'm going to say is that uh, EY prime is basically equal to the value of the electric field uh, evaluated at a, at a coordinate of x plus delta x and a time of t. And the value of EY in our case is just equal to the electric field as a function of x and t. So the way we're going to write the left-hand side of this equation is going to be um, EY of X plus delta X T um, time, well, minus EY of um, X T and all of this multiplied by A. That's the left-hand side now. We just say that it's the value of the electric field that's a function of x and t. Uh, the, the value over here is just defined as electric field at point x. So basically, we're just calling this point x right here. And then, yeah. The value of the function at x plus delta x and the value of the function at x, both evaluated at exactly the same time. At the same time, but just shifted in space. By some value delta x right here. Yeah, delta x. All right. Okay. Let's do the other side. Um, the other side of the equation says we need to take the time derivative negative ddt of the flux. But for our flux, what I'm going to say here is that that in doing v dot da, we're going to say that da is the area vector associated with our loop right here. It's basically related to the area of the loop. <clears throat> And it points in the same direction as this. So our integral, uh, and since we're saying that bz is constant over this, our entire thing right here is just going to become uh, bz times the area a of this loop right here, the derivative of that. But then what's the area of my loop? Well, the area of the loop in this case is basically just a, delta x times a. So this becomes negative ddt of bz times a times delta x. And since these were just quantities that we put into our system, we're going to say that derivative is really only going to act on bz. And we can pull the a delta x out. And so we basically just end up getting a times delta x times negative ddt of the magnetic field's z component. We notice that the a is the same on both sides. We cancel those a's out. And we're going to move the delta x to the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, what we're going to get is, I don't, I don't want to rewrite that whole thing. I'm just going to copy paste it. That divided by delta x ends up being equal to uh, negative, uh, oops, not like that, 
uh, ddt of the magnetic field z component. And then we add one last thing into the statement. What is What happens to the left-hand side of this equation if we take the limit as delta x goes to 0? What happens to this left-hand side thing? Goes to infinity. Yeah, I don't think that's the answer. No? The bottom going to zero doesn't guarantee that the entire fraction goes to infinity unless the top um, doesn't also go to zero, right? The numerator would go to zero and the denominator would go to zero, so it's really about the rate at which they achieve it, right? Is that is that thing that's in the whole left-hand side right there, does that look like something to you guys that you've seen before? You take the value of the function at one location minus the value at another location. It's like basically delta EY, right? Like this whole numerator is basically the change in electric field divided by the change in X, right? And another way that you could write this is it's basically just delta EY over delta X evaluated at the time t, so a fixed time t, and then a limit as delta x goes to zero. Whoa. What is that quantity? Does that look like something you guys have seen before? Delta function over delta, I mean, like, just make it really simple, delta y over delta x. Take the limit. What does that become? This represents slope, right? And if I have a coordinate system and I have a line in that coordinate system, like a curve of some side, some sort in modern language, and I tell you that I can find, you know, that you have to be getting close to seeing what I'm talking about right now. I tell you that I can figure out if I take two different points on my curve right here and right here, that if I draw a line between those points, it gives me the slope of the line, right? delta y over delta x, if this is the y direction, this is the x direction, delta y over delta x equals the slope, right? So what happens if I squeeze, so this is delta x down here now, what happens if I shrink that down to zero? Well, as it gets smaller and smaller, I think Hunter's figuring it out, as, as, I, as I make the distance between these two points smaller and smaller, eventually we're down to a distance between the two of them that's zero, and now you look at basically the exact same thing, delta y over delta x exactly at a point, but it comes a tangent line, right? So there's a mathematical operation that's equivalent to doing the same thing that I just described, right? And what's it called? This finding the slope of a tangent line? It's the instant rate of change. What's another name for it, though? It's another name for a mathematical operation that finds the slope of the tangent line. I know you, I know you guys know what this is. It's a derivative, yeah. This thing becomes dy dx. That's the that's what you do in calculus. You find slopes of tangent lines, right? Um, so so this thing on the left, which is basically change in ey divided by change in x, same thing happens. And now the, the only difference between what I'm doing over here, what you first learn in calculus, and what's happening here, is that this is not a function of just one variable, right? It's a function of two variables, x and t, and presumably y and z as well, but we're doing this one dimensionally. So it has two variables in it, which means when I fix one of the variables in place and I just look at the change in x, that becomes a special type of a derivative. It becomes a partial derivative, right? This becomes del ey del x, right? Yeah, del x is equal to negative uh, ddt. Should I make these partials? These should be partials too. I think by one of you really, yeah, but we'll we'll just be a little bit fuzzy on that and, and change into partials later, I guess. But that's the part, right? But you get this equation, basically, which we're going to hold in our pocket and we're going to use after we do some drawings. Okay. The space rate of change, right? This means the derivative, the rate at which EY changes in the x direction, is directly related to the rate at which the magnetic field changes in the time direction, or the time rate of change of the magnetic field 
is directly related to the space rate of change, the spatial rate of change of the electric field. The rate at which the electric field changes going from here to here between two different wavefronts is directly related to how that magnetic field there is changing in time. It's kind of a lot to like get your head around because it's space, time, magnets, and electricity, like all in one equation if you think about it. So it's it's not exactly simple to look at. But in a very real way, we've, we've known all about this all along because that's what this equation tells us, right? Is the rate at which the magnetic field changes in time is related to the rate at which the electric field circulates, right? In a way, that's what that equation tells us. There's, there's this relationship between space, time, magnets, and electricity, right? And this is just kind of a simple, simplified version of it right here. You guys have any questions about that derivation? So the next thing to do, we need to use the other equation now, because this only tells us part of the story, OK? That's only part of the story. Um, we need to know how the magnetic field changes in space and how that's related to the electric field's rate of change in time, OK? So we're going to go back to this picture here, right? And we're going to draw a new path. And this path is going to be a little harder to draw. So now we've, we're going to draw a new path. Um, and in order to draw this one, I'm going to need to draw the box like this. So now we're going to have a path. Here, let's use the same color. I don't want to change colors. Um, now we're going to have a path that starts from here. Oh god, I hope that fixes itself. And it didn't though. Where did that even come from? Oh no. Okay. I'm assuming okay. I wonder if I move this down here a little bit. That helps some. Okay. The shape. Point. Okay. Now our path is gonna be oh that lined up nicely, didn't it? No. <laughs> it immediately moved. Alright, so our path now is gonna look like this. Copy paste. Copy paste. I'm not gonna copy paste. I'm not gonna do it. Oh, it's right there. Just right on top of it. Okay. This is what our path's gonna be like now. Oh no, it didn't actually do it. No, it's not. What is it doing? Copy paste. There we go. Um, there's my path like that. And then we need lines on the front too. So now we're gonna do a path that kind of comes at us in space. This is part of why I think electricity and magnetism is so tricky is because you need to be able to spatially understand, like, see these things. And I don't think it's always that simple. Oh my god, that looks worse. There we go. And we got to erase. We'll erase the other end. And then we want to copy this one. See, that kind of worked just fine, right, actually? Go over here. Really, we'll just go to here. And we'll cut off. And we'll erase some things. Oh, some of this erasing is not going to look so great, but that piece yeah, I'm not gonna worry about erasing that because it's gonna mess things up okay so that's our path now okay now for this path we're again gonna have to draw uh, an XY plane or actually was it the XZ plane now so we want to get one of these shapes and I want to invert it how am I gonna invert it I probably just draw my own axes uh, shapes so a line like this nope let's use black or we use pink so purple So that's one axis, and then the other axis is going to be pointing like this. I guess I should use arrows for these, maybe. Yeah, it doesn't really matter, I guess. So what is this going to be? We're looking from downwards into the XZ to into the XZ plane. So this is going to be um, X, Z, and then there's your origin, where the y positive, I guess I can draw in here that the, I think the positive, we're looking at it. Like we're looking basically our eyeballs are up here right and we're looking downwards that's what that's what this is going to be over here on the right I, don't, I really shouldn't be doing each shape copying each shape okay yep um so this is positive x this is positive z and let's put our box in there which is our uh shapes i think this is our path Okay, and now we're looking at the magnetic field in this region. Okay, and we're going to say our magnetic field 
is going to look something like this. On the left-hand side here, you see that it points in the positive z direction, right? So we'll draw a magnetic field right here. Nope, not like that. I have to do this one. Mouse again. So we go black shapes like this. Our magnetic field here, we said that it was bigger on the left side, so we'll draw one vector right there for that. And then another shape on the right-hand side. We'll say the magnetic field's a little bit smaller on the right-hand side. It just basically, it changes as we move from here to here. That's all that really matters. It doesn't have the same value uh, as you move from place to face in space. So the magnetic field here is going to be what we call bz. And the magnetic field over here is going to be what we call bz prime. And our path direction here is also going to be kind of similar to what we did before. Um, because we're going to say that our electric field now is the one that we're going to kind of average over this region of space. Uh, this is uh, e, uh, EY, right? Coming out at you, right? Because if you're looking downwards, the electric field is going to look like it's pointing up at you. And then that's our, that's our path. Um, well, let's take this. Hopefully you can see how this comes to this. And we're going to cut this come down here and do something really similar to what we just did, but just with a different equation. So we'll go through a little bit faster this time, probably. Uh, once again, uh, we'll label some things about this. We're going to say that the length of this side over here is, so A is going to be the length of this side here. And once again, delta x, which is going to be a very small value, uh, is going to be um, uh, this side over here. That's delta x. Our path direction now uh, is going to be similar to before. Um, what do we use for path? I think we use black, right? No, we use red. Our path direction for what we're going to do here is going to point like this. So that's going to be our ds. And at this way, it's going to go up. So you can see that it's opposite direction to this one. And on the top, it's going to go that way. And then what here? It's going down this way. That's our path direction, right? We're going around this path. And why do we need a path? Because we're going to use Ampere's law. So we start with Ampere's, the Ampere-Maxwell law. I'm just going to call it Ampere's Law. Uh, Ampere's Law states that if you take the line integral, not of the electric field, but the magnetic field, dot ds, around a closed path, that there's a relationship between this and um, a couple things. So you're going to have two terms here. There's one that's uh, mu naught times the current enclosed by your loop. Um, there's another term that is the time derivative multiply by something, multiply by mu naught times epsilon naught, um, the time derivative of the electric flux. Okay. Now, one thing I left out of this was uh, we're talking about free space here. So I, this is a huge piece I left off. I forgot about this. We're talking about the propagation of light through, through the vacuum, right? Go back to what we're this is starlight emanating out of these waves of electric field and magnetic field in the vacuum, right? And because we're in the vacuum, free space, that means there are not going to be any currents, okay? This means that there are no free charges and there are no currents in the system. There's no electric currents in space, right? You guys can get with that idea. There's no electric currents just flowing through space because to have electric current, you need a wire, right? You need something that has conductive particles, charged particles that can flow. And space doesn't have that, at least not in the number you would need um, to have a current. So there's no currents and there's no charges, okay? That doesn't mean you can't have, well, we'll talk about it. So that means that this term right here is gonna be zero. There's no currents in space. So we're only gonna be dealing with the other piece of the equation, right? Let's do that. The left-hand side of this equation tells us that we take the line integral of b dot ds. Well, in this case, let's start on the left-hand side here, I guess. We're going to have, um, uh, we're black, right? Okay, we have, we're going to have bz on the left multiplied by a, that's the length of the side, right? And on the right-hand side, we're going to have minus bz prime times a. And in the middle, you know, we're going to say, okay, the electric, or sorry, the magnetic field here is this way. These two are at right angles to each other, so you get no contribution to the line integral on the bottom. And you say the same thing up here. You say there's a right angle between bz and ds, so you get nothing on the top. So you only get contributions on the left side and the right side. And one's negative because that's how this works, right? Okay. So um, what we get then is on the right-hand side, um, mu naught epsilon naught 
constants that came about naturally through the derivation of these equations. Um, and then the time derivative of the flux. Okay, now what's the flux going to be? Well, flux is just electric field times area. So if we tell you that the area vector in this case, um, our dA or whatever you want to call it, points out of the page, well, then the flux through this thing is just going to be the electric field times the area. So let's skip past writing the integral then and say it's basically just ddt of the electric field um, multiplied by the area of my box. Well, what's the area? Again, it's a times delta x, right? So multiplied by a and then times delta x. And we basically say that the, the, uh, the derivative is really only going to act on a field. And so ultimately what we end up getting is this. Um, we end up getting on the left-hand side. Um, let me move up a little bit. We've got bz. There's an a in every term, right? We're going to immediately cancel the a's. Uh, we've got bz, which is a function, remember, of x and t. And then minus bz prime, which is basically, uh, you know, um, the, the, the electric, the magnetic field com z component evaluated at another coordinate, so at x plus delta x. And all of this gets divided by delta x and ends up being equal to uh, mu naught epsilon naught. Let me redraw this equal sign in a different place. Equals mu naught epsilon naught uh, multiplied by the time derivative of the electric field y component. On the left-hand side, we make the exact same statement we did before, but notice there's a negative sign here. So if we pull a negative sign out of the left-hand side, it would look like negative, negative, and then a positive here. That doesn't change anything, right? So the whole left-hand side, if we take the limit as delta x approaches 0, is now going to end up being the negative of the partial derivative of bz uh, with respect to x is equal to mu naught, epsilon naught, and then the time derivative. I'm going to go ahead and turn this into a partial now for reasons that um, will become apparent in the next line. Get this, to get this equation out to. These have to be partial derivatives because the electric field y component is a function of x and t. And in order to do the step that we did here, where we said that the electric field is roughly constant, we have to basically be saying we're, we're holding x constant while taking a partial with respect to t here. And bz is also a function of x and t too. So combination there requires that uh, we turn these into partial derivatives, really. All right. You guys have any questions? Okay. We've done a lot of mathematics, but I promise you we're really close to being done with this derivation. There's only a couple more lines. So now what we need to do is to take this solution of Ampere's law, right? And this solution, I'll copy it. I'll rewrite it down here. Let's just write it to the left. So, because I, I want them to look kind of similar to each other. So this one above says, if I take the partial of EY with respect to X, this should be equal to the negative, and I really should use partials now, partial of BZ with respect to T. Partial derivatives, right? So those are our two equations we want to combine together. Now, maybe I'll give you guys a second to look at these two equations and ask any questions that you want, because the, the next step is going to be... Uh, it's like one more step and we're kind of done. Does anyone have any questions so far? Let's talk about what they say in words. This says that the rate at which the magnetic field changes in time directly affects the rate at which the electric field changes in space. And at the same time, the electric field's time rate of change is related to the way in which the magnetic field oscillates in space. So you have time oscillation, or time change, and spatial change, and they're connecting each other. Right. It's just like how the rate at which the x-coordinate of an object changes is related to its velocity. Okay, this thing's kind of getting laggy here. I don't know what's going on here. So, okay. The last thing, uh, or the next thing to do now, is to say, let's take um, for the upper equation, we're going to take um, 
believe the time derivative of this one. I don't think it matters which way we do this, right? Uh, doesn't matter at all how we do this, right? Just looking at my notes real quick. One with you. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take the spatial derivative of this equation, and we're going to take the time derivative of this equation. That's what we're going to do. This is a different thing to show what we're going to get. Should work, right? So the left-hand side of this equation here is going to become negative. Wow, that's hard to write. So left-hand side of this is going to become a mixed partial derivative, which we write like this. It's a mixed partial. The right-hand side, we're taking the time derivative of both sides, right? So the right-hand side is just going to become u naught epsilon naught, and then it's going to be the second derivative, that is to say, like this, of ey. Mixed partial on the left, double partial derivative on the right. For the one over here, we're going to have, on the left-hand side, it's going to become the second derivative of ey with respect to x. And on the right-hand side, we're once again going to get the same mixed partial, I believe. So that's going to be the partial derivative of bz first with respect to uh, what um, x and then t. And then we'll say that the order of these doesn't actually matter. It's something that, you know, have you guys done this in Calc 3? If you haven't taken Calc 3, maybe not, I don't know. If I have a function and x is not a function of time and time is not a function of x, then if I take the partials, it doesn't matter what order I take them in. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Does that sound familiar to you? It does. Okay, good. That would be like saying if bz was equal to x squared t plus t cubed x squared, that if I take, it doesn't matter what order I take the derivatives in, right? You can try it yourself. Like, take the derivative with respect to time first, and then x, you'll get an answer. Take the derivative with respect to x first, and then time, you'll get an answer. And both cases will be the same, right? Um, yeah, feel free to pr prove that for yourself, because just listening to me say that isn't necessarily, like, it doesn't matter the order, right? So what that basically means is that these two equations are equal to each other. That this piece is equal to this piece, and that's exactly what we want. Because now what we can say is that, um, I'm going to write it in a little bit different way. We're going to move this piece to the right-hand side. I'm going to say that if I take the second derivative of the electric field y component with respect to time, that this is equivalent to 1 divided by u naught epsilon naught multiplied by the second derivative of that same function, ey, with respect to x. Okay. And now one other thing. This quantity here, 1 divided by mu naught epsilon naught, it's actually equal to something. Do you guys know what it's equal to? We actually calculated it. I don't know if it was last time or two weeks ago. I don't remember. If you, if you calculate what this is, you take the permittivity of free space, as they call it, times the magnetic permeability of free space, the values of the magnetic and the electric constants in our universe, and you take the inverse of that, this happens to be exactly equal to something. Do you guys remember what it's equal to? We'll just we're calculated again if you want to um okay so let's find the ee web calculator you can calculate it yourself if you know what these things are off the top of your head you want to answer yet i'm gonna go back and look through your notes it's the speed of light it's related to the speed of light that's exactly right let's uh let's pull this up and actually calculate it real quickly too just to kind of prove to you guys again i told you guys earlier that this is a wave that propagates at the speed of light and if we take the values of these right here, so you do one divided by, so mu naught was equal to, here, let's, let's do it like this. So mu naught is four pi times 10 to the negative seven. So we do times one, all right? Uh, I don't think that's a negative sign that I just pushed there. I think that's the negative sign. Um, and that's multiplied by epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is a quantity that's equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And we're saying if you take the inverse of this, you get 9 times 10 to the 16. 
and that is exactly equal to, so I told you the speed of light was three times 10 to the eight, right? If I square that, you get exactly the same number, which is remarkable, utterly remarkable. This was already known to be the speed of light, and it just happens to be the case that when you multiply mu naught times epsilon naught, you take the inverse like we have over here, you literally get the speed of light squared, which is just boggles my mind. So this quantity is exactly equal to what we call c squared, the speed of light. So the more proper way to write this equation right here would just be to replace here. That's because I don't, <laughs> I don't like writing the, I don't like writing the partials or whatever. Just replace this. Come on, you can do it, computer. Stop. Uh, it's like really struggling here. I don't know why. I click off that. There we go. I want to erase just this part here and say that piece is basically equal to the speed of light squared. Now this is an equation that has a very particular form, something that if you've taken 1b, you may have seen before. Um, it has a name too. When you take a function and you take the second or the derivative with respect to time and you relate it to the, the same function that you take the second derivative with respect to space and you get a, con a constant right here, this has this equation, it's a type of equation that has a name that you may have studied in physics 1b. This type of equation is called, does anyone know? The general function would look something like this. It'd be like del 2 x, uh, not, de, not x, y, sorry. It'd be del 2 y, del t 2 would be equal to um, the velocity squared of the partial derivative of the same function with respect to x. What is that called? Those of you guys that have taken 1b, 1d. No. Well, 1d or 1b, honestly. It's probably talked about in both of them. What's that kind of an equation called? Oh, there's a 2 down here. Never mind. Does anyone know? It's okay if you don't. We call this a wave equation because it describes uh, a traveling wave. Do you guys recognize that, that expression? It's okay. I don't know how much this stuff is emphasized in your classes. Now, this is the general form of the wave equation right here. This could describe the position of... Um, Like, the, the way I think about it is a string, I think is the easiest thing to understand this. So if I like draw, no, I don't wanna do that one, I wanna do this one. If I draw like a coordinate system where I tell you that I hold a string uh, at one location here and I hold a string at one location here, right? And let's say that I, I whip the string, okay? And I create a pulse, right? And say that pulse basically travels travels forwards, right? So it, at, at first it's there, and then maybe it's here, and then it kind of gets weaker as it goes to the end of the string, right? But this pulse basically, you think about, you take a hose, right? And you, you lift it up and you whip it really quickly, right? Or a whip itself, right? Or a piece of string, right? And if this is the y direction, and this is the x direction, then the y as a function of x and t describes basically the shape of the pulse. Oops, shape of pulse. Okay, now that you know it's a wave equation, do you guys know what the solution, the general solution to the wave equation is? The general solution to one of these wave equations is that to get a function that satisfies this, this is a differential equation, right? It's a differential equation because it relates the function. The function that satisfies the wave equation is any function it's a function of position and time because it travels happens to have this type of feature. It's going to be y of something like x minus dt. Any function of that form will satisfy the wave equation. It's guaranteed to, okay? An example, y of x and t. Really simple one. Oops. Uh, 
something like this, 1 divided by uh, x minus 3t. And let's just square this for good measure. That will be a wave. What's another one? Uh, probably the most common one that maybe you think about when you think about waves is the sinusoidal wave. But waves don't have to be sinusoidal. Like a pulse on a string is also a wave. Um, a sinusoidal wave would be something like, um, let's say, some amplitude, y max, multiplied by, um, I don't know, a sine function, right? Sine of some x minus vt. Now, I'll show how both of these satisfy them, but I want to I wanna show you a picture of what these look like. So uh, to, to, to plot what one of these solutions might look like here. Now, remember, we're talking about electromagnetic waves, but I'm, I'm kind of shifting gears to describe waves in general, traveling waves, right? Um, and this is a really good time to take a break. You guys want to take a break? What I'm going to do next is we're going to go to Wolfram Alpha. And we're going to plot these, these equations that I've written here and show how they look like what are called traveling waves. Okay? So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And then um, when you guys come back, we'll talk about it. Let's take like a 10-minute break. So let's break until... I'll stop for a second. Do you guys have any questions? Let's pause the recording.